everybody is tired and poor and sick of trying. If you see me on a corner, will you stop or will you splash me? Take a listen to what we've become at Columbia House Party. Jake, what's up? Not much. How you doing, buddy? I'm all right. Drinking a giant green tea out of a ceramic mug made by our friend Katie Heindel. Well, that just sounds lovely. Yeah, you can check her ceramics out at Weird Vessels on Instagram. It's a lovely mug and it holds so much green tea. <laughs> that sounds like a very healthy thing to do. Yeah, it's uh, it's all right. How are you doing, man? I'm okay. I'm a little tired, but, you know, pushing through. Uh, we do have a guest today. Today, the band we're doing, uh, this is uh, not to objectify these fine gentlemen. I hope that we are aging as well as these guys because look pretty good for like 25 years of touring together. I can almost guarantee you that we are not. Yeah. Uh, although maybe maybe you are. You're drinking a whole thing of green tea. So maybe you're, you're taking better care of yourself than I am. So I'm not. <laughs> Let me just stop you there. Uh, we're talking about Billy Talent today. A band that I Mandela affected myself about, which I'll explain a little (laughs) later with our guest. A band that was kind of my first and overdue teenage realization that punk should be political. Uh, And one of the defining sounds, looks, and art of a fairly significant explosion in the Canadian scene. Today, we're talking about Billy Town. His name is Bastard Son. Outside the NBA, James Herbert. What's up, man? (laughs) (laughs) I'm Bastard Son now. (laughs) What a stumbly intro. I don't know, man. You logged in as KJ McDaniels. You uh, got brought in on a song that said, my name is Bastard Son, like right as we brought you in. I don't know. I like I'll it. take it. KJ McDaniels, Bastard Son, whatever you want to call me. It all works. Yes. Um, for anyone who doesn't remember, James Herbert joined us on our At The Drive-In episode uh, a little while back. So made sense to bring him in for the band that uh, borrowed from At The Drive-In a little bit, we'll say. If you don't know James, uh, you can follow him at Outside The NBA on all your socials. He's a phenomenal NBA writer for CBS Sports uh, and a good friend of ours. And we have a little Billy Talent connection between the two of us that we'll get into uh, a little later. So, James, thank you for being here. And I guess before we start getting into it, why Billy Town? Why were you game to do this episode with us? Other than the fact that I uh, messaged you 24 hours before and there are no (laughs) NBA media availabilities right this second. I mean, that's the main reason. But no, I mean, Billy Talent, like their their first um, their self-titled record. I listened to to that record like crazy after it came out. And I just, I honestly couldn't tell you the last time I I put it on before you messaged me, but I have listened to it in the last 24 hours. And like, it's still like, I still like the same things about it that I, that I liked back then. And like, remarkably, I still remember most of the lyrics on, on the album. (laughs) Um, I, I remember in 12th grade, uh, listening to it while like doing homework. Uh, I remember seeing them a few times in, in and around different parts of Ontario. Uh, it's not a band that like, I mean, we, we did the at the drive-in episode and frankly, like that was on a list of, I gave you a few bands of bands that all like meant quite a lot to me that it were, that still remain some of my favorite bands. Like Billy Talent is not in that category for me. Like I did not remain a big Billy Talent guy, but just specifically that album, like it puts me in a very specific place and time frame 
in my life. And it's fun to kind of look, look back at something like that now. It sure does. It puts me in my dad's uh, navy blue Toyota Matrix. I was the car that I learned to drive on. This album came out, I believe, the second or third week of grade 12. Uh, so I had my license and I would actually, this is how ridiculous people are in high school, but especially me, I guess. Uh, I would wake up at like 630 in the morning to drive my dad 20 minutes to work, drive home, go back to sleep for a little bit, get up and like shower and go to school and then have to rush to pick my dad up after school. All so that I could just drive to school instead of walking like the 15 or 20 minutes so that I could like go out for lunch with my friends. Anyway, Billy Talent was because of the timing of when I got my license and when this album came out, if not the first uh, CD I had in my car, very, very close to being the first CD I had in my car. Uh, also responsible for me going to Queens in in part. My cousin, Ted was a uh, he lives in Alaska now but we had a lot of music overlap when I was a teen and he was uh, at university and he was at Queens for nursing and as I was deciding I applied to five different schools for five different programs having no idea what I wanted to do and uh, I got into Queens business and my cousin was like yeah, yeah come out and like we'll hang out all the time and um, by the way you know uh, Billy Talent's playing here in September and that obviously wasn't the reason that I chose to go there but it was like part of the sell of like oh I could go to concerts with my my cool older cousin who has the same taste in music <laughs> as me unfortunately my cousin Ted moved to Alaska like a couple months after I got to Queens uh so didn't quite work out but yeah uh Jake what about you man I know you're not a uh, quite as big a Billy Talent fan as James and I. yeah um they never really clicked for me oh obviously like I was super aware of them because as you guys know, being in Canada, how could you not be? Uh, I remember when they came out, uh, when try honesty hit and I thought it was, I liked the fact that something that sounded like it was getting so much attention and airplay because obviously as like, I still don't, I don't understand how this band is so big just because of how they sound. Uh, but yeah, they just never really worked for me. And like, they have a couple songs that I like, but I never got into them. I've n I truly couldn't tell you a song of theirs after the, I guess it's the second album. Uh, and I would only know the singles from that one, but yeah, I just, it, it's, I've never really understood why they don't work for me because I obviously do like a lot of music that is sort of in this vein. Like we talked on the at the drive-in episode. And as you said, these guys take a lot from that. And I love at the drive-in, but they never, I just like, <laughs> I just don't, like listening to them uh yeah, and i don't mind i mean we let, yeah sorry we can we can pivot from that and like um you know we'll unpack that a little more as we go through it um because you know obviously you're allowed to have your opinion in this case it's uh <laughs> this isn't going to turn into an interrogation <laughs> just yeah, put me under um, the light how dare you <laughs> you know maybe it was just that you didn't have that uh that unknown bonding moment that james and i had at uh aj's hangar in <laughs> kingston in 2004 james and i went to the same university the same years lived in the same residence building right. played in the same intramural basketball league and went to some of the same concerts including uh, a billy talent one early in our freshman year and it was literally in frosh week like right when we got there yeah and we didn't know each other until much much later despite all of those things in common Weird. Yeah. I, what do you remember from that show? Like I, cause I didn't have a concert buddy that I already was like moving to Kingston to hang out with. So I just, I honestly just went by myself. Um, and I, I, all I remember is that it was sweaty as hell. Like I was just like yes. packed in with like a million people and everybody was jumping. They probably sold like oversold that place. Um, and I remember it being great, but I also just remember it was hot. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I remember two other things. The first is that I Mandela affected myself into believing for a long time that that was uh, not an all ages show. And I had gotten in despite not being of age. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that for so long. I guess maybe because I went with my older cousin. Uh, I don't know. But for like years, I thought that that was not an all ages show. And I think actually me and you may be talking about it. I was like, oh, it wasn't an all ages show. And I also remember... And this, for anyone who has paid attention to the world or follows me on Twitter the last little while, this might sound uh, strange, but I was very annoyed that they took an aside to talk shit about George Bush. 
Um, and that's what I meant <laughs> earlier when I kind of said that, like, like my cousin afterwards was like, no, man, like, if you are into punk music, like, you better call out shit like George Bush. And me coming from small town Ontario, you know, I guess small town Ontario doesn't even help, doesn't help explain it. But just like being 18 and ignorant and dumb, not caring at all about the world around me yet. Uh, it was very striking for everyone else to be on board with it. And my cousin to be like, yeah, you loser. How can you listen to punk music and not like the politics <laughs> part of it? Love to be into punk and hate politics. Yeah. Uh, the one other thing I'll say about Billy Talent that I think makes them an important part of our kind of CanCon pop punk arc here is uh, I actually had a conversation with our friend Sasha Kalra the other day. And he was, you know, he, there's a ton of music overlap with Sasha and us. I asked Sasha having a non-white person in a pretty prominent uh, position in Billy Talent's case, Ian DeSaw is uh, of Indian descent and was born in the UK. And, and Sasha, you know, conf- my thinking was that that would have been uh, pretty cool to see if you're a non-white person in a predominantly uh, white scene. And Sasha confirmed that, yeah, it was, it was awesome uh, for him to, to kind of see that representation. So I think the fact that uh, Billy Talent had a couple of second generation European immigrants and a uh, a non-white member kind of helped, uh, you know, they're, they're a good representation of what a Toronto scene uh, maybe should look like. You know, that representation is still not fully there in the scene. So um, important in that regard as well. We're going to get into Billy Talent. We're going to get into Pez and Jake. We're going to get into Ska after this. Oh, finally. All right, so uh, Jake, I know you're not uh, the biggest Billy Talent fan, but I'm wondering if you are a fan of Pez without knowing it. For a little background, Ben Kowalowitz, the lead singer of Billy Talent, born in Montreal, raised in Streetsville, went to high school in Mississauga. He was the drummer in a band called To Each His Own with Jonathan Gallant uh, on bass. So Ben then moved to vocals and guitar, and Aaron Solowaniak uh, came in on drums. And then they added Ian DeSaw on guitar, vocals, keyboards, and to do a lot of writing. Uh, They named their band Pez. They were 16 and 17 at this time, and they'd go to a lot of downtown shows like Head and Treble Charger and said, we were like, why can't we do that? Uh, The first two shows they did were at their high school. They eventually released an EP under the name Pez called Dude Box in 1996 and an LP called Watoosh in 1998. Uh, It was recorded in Ian's parents' basement. And Jake, it's a kind of ska. This is Just the Thought by Pez. Hey! Um, I just thought I'm a part of this one, so I'm sort of all the battles in the world. Jake, a little more, a little more up your alley. Uh, it definitely sounds like a young band from Ontario in 1996. Yeah, uh, there's. I feel like, like everybody's everybody's first band. <laughs> I think kind of sounded like that if you're of a certain age. Yes, uh, Ben Kowalowitz, by the way, as he told uh, Q on CBC a couple years ago, he evaluated just the thought as quote embarrassing for me. The rest of the band sound great. I was addicted to Rage Against the Machine at the time. Um, so, you know, Ben doing, you you can hear pretty quickly how Kowalowicz's lyrics would lend themselves to uh, a Rage impersonation. Uh, and then to put that over like a funky bass-oriented ska band is uh, pretty funny. Did they get, sound like an Earl Haig band? That's a very obscure Toronto reference that only five people will get. Yeah, I, I certainly don't. Um, James... 
have you ever gone back and listened to the the early Billy Talent stuff, like Pez era Billy Talent, or even like the Billy the era of Billy Talent between Pez and the Billy Talent album? Yeah. So this is going to be incredibly niche as well. Do you guys remember the band The Salads? Oh yeah. What was it? Get Loose okay. was that the? Yeah. What was the yeah. single? So, yeah. Yeah, Get Loose was one. The Roth Kung Fu was another. Like the, the um, Come Kung, On Everybody yeah. Get Loose tonight? Yeah, that's the salads. Um, yeah. So I briefly was taking guitar lessons with the guy, like with one, the, actually the bassist of the salads. And he at one point had like filled in, um, I think for Ian or one of the members of Billy Talent and like gone on tour with them. And like those two bands, like when they were, I don't know if it was um, only after they had become Billy Talent or whether it was when they were still called Pez, but like those two bands had like played together a lot and toured together. And I remember him telling me that like their sound worked really well. Like the, the salads are, if you haven't heard them, they're kind of like a, almost like a party rock band. Like there's, there's ska ish. There's like some like reggae stuff. Like they actually had a member of the band who like he's in the band, but he doesn't play an instrument. He just dances like that. That is his job. He does break dancing. Like the boss and he's on stage. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I remember when like, you know, I'd go in for a guitar lesson. He was like teaching me some of the stuff on the Billy Talent record and saying like, yeah, like, I don't know if like we work that well together anymore because Billy Talent became kind of a more straight ahead rock band. But like before they totally did. And like, I remember going back and listening to uh, there's this demo version, an old version of the the first track. This is how it goes on the, the self-titled record. And it sounds kind of like what we just heard. Like it's it's very Scottish. It is like completely different. There are some like riffs that are the same, some lyrics are the same. Like you can understand how it got from A to B, but they were just like really like they were an entirely different band for a long time. And they went in a very different direction uh, before they put out that self-titled record. And I, I imagine that a lot of their fans like just wouldn't know unless they they looked and and kind of tracked their trajectory um but but yeah they they were a totally different band i never really got like i didn't know about that stuff when it was happening um like i didn't know anything about pez i i do remember seeing stuff about billy talent like playing local shows and like seeing like strombolopolis wear their shirts on much music but i i didn't actually know who they were until they had changed their sound Uh, before they got to that point they were forced to change the name if you're wondering why they aren't called Pez, uh, other than that, it would be a little tougher to take a band called Pez seriously, maybe. They were uh, sued by an American band that was also called Pez. And then when they were trying to come up with a new name, Ben suggested Billy Talent, which is the name of a character from Hardcore Logo. Shout out Bruce McDonald, by the way. <laughs> I love Bruce um, McDonald. So at this point, we're talking like seven, eight, nine years into the band and as ben told q at cbc we dedicated ourselves to this band way before anything actually happened we kind of did everything and were independent for 10 years before we got signed Uh, they all worked side jobs for a long time as you do when you're a new band and one of ben's was working as an assistant on the ongoing history of new music at edge 102.1 a local toronto radio station there he met jen hurst who eventually moved from the edge into an a and r role with Warner Music Canada, which helped land them a demo deal uh, with Warner Music Canada and helped connect them with producer Gavin Brown, who'd eventually produced the self-titled. In 2001, they released an EP called Try Honesty, which is um, where that This Is How It Goes demo is from. It's a little bit of a different sound as James laid out, uh, but three of the songs would eventually be tweaked for the album. Uh, If you go on Discogs and try to find the Try Honesty EP from 2001, it is very expensive. So if you have one of those and you're a big fan of the podcast, forget contributing to Patreon. Slide me that EP. Um, this is what they sounded like on that EP. This is the This Is How It Goes demo clip. Yeah, Take a look at 
song, by the way, is about Aaron's battle with MS, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit toward the end of this podcast, but that's what it was uh, written about. James, what, what stands out to you about the change from, I mean, in their sound in general, but specifically for that song? Because I think that's the one that best highlight, if you listen to the, like, Try Honesty, the, the album version just sounds like the demo version, but a little, sp- or the EP version, rather, but a little sped up. But This Is How It Goes sounds, you know, notably different. Yeah, I think they just they went for something that had a lot more of a hard edge to it that like I don't know that they would have broken in the same way if they were playing all of their songs the way that they were playing them before. If like I, I think what initially attracted me to the band, honestly, like was that first song on the record. Like I I thought that was like a really like just kind of a, a statement almost like I, I love that song. And I'm not saying that the demo is bad or anything. It's just. I don't know that that was going to be played on the radio and on TV at at the time. And I think I don't, I don't know if this was like a deliberate like like, oh, we we're now hanging out with like Warner Music people and we just we want to be more professional or like if they were this was just where their taste leaned. I, I don't want to accuse them of just being like awful sellouts or anything like I actually liked the changed version, like the the actual version of the song on the record more than I like the demo. Um, so I'm not saying that, but I I just feel like there w- there had to be some kind of conscious choice. Like we're not going to be the type of band that we were before that we've been for like, what, a decade or so. Um, and I think that is everything they did over that decade kind of like was baked into the product that we eventually got as this debut record. Again, it's what they say about like, oh, yeah, it, it seems like an overnight success, but it, it's it's never it's never actually like that. Like, I, I think they came out of the box with like a very tight band, a very professional band, a band that knew how to play live, a band that like, I mean, just I think if you look at the production on the first record and you compare that to the demo, like they it, it sounds great. Um, so I, I think they were kind of seasoned musicians by then and they made a choice that they were going to be kind of a punky like Buzzcocks influenced at the drive in influenced rock band that was like weird, but weird mainly because of Ben, not weird because of the instrumentation. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, hooking up with Gavin Brown as a producer kind of speaks to what you're saying. And, and Gavin Brown has produced some some really good bands. But prior to this, the biggest albums he'd produced uh, or played on as a musician, rather, were, you know, he was in uh, Great Big C for a little bit. He was in Big Sugar for a little bit. Um, he worked with Jason Collette from Broken Social Scene. Uh, and then he'd go on to do things like Three Days Grace and Thornley and Tea Party and, you know, some of the, the harder stuff like Cancer Bats. Um, but you know, this, I feel like he had a good handle on how to make them uh, like radio accessible, I guess, with what their sound was. It's fitting that you mentioned the Buzzcocks because that's, uh, they opened for the Buzzcocks on their first major US tour in 2003, which uh, they spoke very highly of and was was very cool. Uh, their first big Canadian tour, by the way, was with I'm Mother Earth and 30 Seconds to Mars. Uh, shout out to oh, wow. the worst Joker. Yeah. <laughs> Not a show for Jake. Yeah, uh, I saw 30 Seconds of Mars once at Warp Tour, and it was a lot. That was enough for you? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I never and never will see them. No. Yeah. After the uh, they 30 Seconds of Mars have one good song called Attack, but that's about it. Not worth seeing an entire set of Warp Tour for. <laughs> if they're at a, they're the if they're at a festival, they're the like it's time to get dinner band. Yeah. Um, so. After coming off the EP, they they get connected with Gavin Brown. Uh, they actually sign with a co venture. A co-venture with Atlantic Records and Warner Music Canada for the uh, self-titled. As I mentioned, it drops two weeks into grade 12, which, if you're not my age, is inaccurate. But <laughs> I'm in charge of this podcast episode, so deal with it. Um, we should start doing that every episode. We should yeah. only date when they came out by where we were in our personal lives. Oh, You can very much tell that I've been ex- very busy the last couple of weeks and... Um, I'm just losing my mind on this episode, I guess. I like it. Yeah. Uh, so they come out of the gate with Try Honesty as a lead single, which pretty great choice because that song kicks ass and it got them uh, some pretty good play. This is Try Honesty. And if you're listening to this episode of this podcast, you surely know Try Honesty. <laughs>
is I don't want I won't say I won't overstate it by saying iconic, but it is like one of the 10 second chunks of music that I have like the biggest association with. I can take you right back to exactly where I am, like driving on Myers Road in <laughs> said Toyota Matrix <laughs> on my way to Adam Wood's house to, you know, I don't know. I don't know that part. I don't remember. Probably sit in the hot tub and me not drink while everyone else drinks. But <laughs> uh, James, you have a, a fond memory of Try Honesty as well from your time on International Exchange. Yeah, I have a lot of memories of that song. Um, just it was it was inescapable for a while, right? Like I, I think there was a point oh, yeah. in there was a point in grade twelve uh, <laughs> where um, I don't think I ever needed to hear that song again. And it, it was it was just kind of everywhere. And I would listen to the record and I might skip it. But now uh, when I go back and listen to it, it's like, I mean, it, it might be the best song. Like, I, I think there's a reason why it was such a big hit. And it wasn't actually like this was news to me when I found out like it was not just a hit in Canada. Like I in my um, third year of, of college, I was on exchange in England and I remember hearing it at like, you know, like the student union, they'd have like rock nights. And like, I remember going to a similar thing in, in London on a weekend and like the song would come on and people would go crazy. And I was just like, wait, what, like, what the fuck is happening? Like, I did not think, like, I knew they were not big in America and like, that still is true. But, you know, I, I think you guys talked about this with Alexis. Um, some of these bands just, they end up getting covered in the British press and they end up successfully touring the UK and they end up pretty big there. And I think that happened with Billy Talent. And I think that specifically happened with that song. And people people loved it. And like I remember people wanting to know more about them from me, the Canadian boy, uh, who had stories to tell them about uh, seeing Billy Talent in Toronto. So, yeah, hearing it now, it, it brings me back to a few different shows. But then it also brings me back to like random nights at the University of Warwick, which is I, admittedly strange. Yeah. That's uh, that is. <laughs> I didn't go on exchange. Um, almost everyone from Queens goes on exchange at some point, and I didn't, so I don't really know what that's like. I do know that this song won an MMVA for best rock video. If you are one of our American listeners, an MMVA is a Much Music Video Award, which is our Canadian version of uh, MTV whatever awards. Try Honesty was one of the first songs they wrote after their name and sound change. So we've stumbled on. Sometimes Jake and I have gone back and forth a couple of times, whether like the first album, the second album or the third album is the most interesting to do for a band. Uh, and we have had a couple lately where like one of the first songs the band wrote was this enormous hit. Um, I think the one most recently was Disturbed Down With The Sickness. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so pretty pretty good uh, feel for the name change and the songwriting change. Um, James, you mentioned earlier that like Strombo would wear their shirts and, um, you know, you'd see Billy Talent on the punk show. And I, initially, I don't think anyone really knew what they were. And the sound was like at least a little unique that like I think people who weren't, you know, at all uh, reachable from the scene, like maybe heard Ben's vocals and were like, oh, that's kind of screamo or whatever. Um, but Try Honesty hitting the charts, it even did chart in the US a little bit and, and hit the UK alternative charts. But I think that's kind of what started very early on this build. And we'll talk about after how, you know, uh, none of us really stuck with them for, for all that long uh, as a band. But I think that was kind of the start of them transitioning from, you know, being a band for people in the scene to being, as you said, over text, James, uh, a band for normies. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm kind of curious about like when you are driving out for lunch from school with your, your friends in your car and blasting Billy Talent, like what their reactions were and if those friends were more normies or if they were all like punk and emo kid no all my friends were like hip-hop kids so i i was like constantly roasted for what i listened okay. to in my car um because like the experience that i had was I, I don't know that there's another band that i liked that so quickly went from like who were these guys um oh i i, I like these guys to like wait am i basic and like that the yeah <laughs> I, I think fallout boy is the best example of it but billy talents right there yeah it just because that first single was such a big hit and because they built on that and kept putting out music videos that were played on much music they kept getting play on the edge they kept playing bigger and bigger shows like it there was this thing that happened where 
people would be like at first it was like, Ugh, like, why would you listen to this guy's voice? Like, I can't stand it. It's so annoying. Like his name's Billy. What? What's the deal? Is Talon his last name to like <laughs> a lot of my friends who didn't give a shit about music and never wanted to go to shows with me being like, oh, yeah, like Billy Talent's cool. Like your taste in music is weird, but like I do like Billy Talent I'm like that. That happened with like a few people in my high school. And I mean, it just it's you see that happen when a band blows up. It is just the, like what was unique about this was just how fast it happened. Like the the period of time where I was listening to Billy Talent and I didn't feel like everybody else was too. Like, I don't know how long it, it, it was, but it felt like it's the snap of a finger. Yeah, I also I, I mean, they did have four singles off of this album. So maybe, you know, like you said, they just kept making videos. And, and I think in a second, we're going to talk about a couple of those videos being controversial. And I wonder if maybe that helped just like because they were in the press and stuff like that. Um, I don't really know how much stock we should put in. I just think like like to your point about the amount of videos, like the album cycle for this album in particular was ex- I actually don't know how long it was in reality, but it felt extremely long. Like when I went back to this album for this episode, I was surprised that all four of those songs are on this album. Like I had for sure earmarked at least one of them for the follow up. Yeah. Because in my in my mind, and maybe this is a Mandela effect thing as well, but in my mind, the four singles from this record that were on much music all the time were it was like three years, which I'm sure it wasn't. But like especially uh Nothing to Lose and River Below, I was convinced they were on the follow up. And actually I've realized that I have no sense of what their like timeline is because when I looked it up, the two singles that I thought were on the third record are in fact on the second record. Yeah. So it's, um, it's tough because the album came out and like you said, the four singles were rolled out over 14 months, um, which is like, right. It's like, I feel like the early to mid two thousands were this weird, like the internet was obviously there and like people were starting to consume their music that way, but music videos hadn't like gone away in their importance yet. So you could still, it was like the last era of extending an album's shelf life out this long. Mm -hmm. And then they also like Billy talent two didn't come out for almost three years after Billy talent one. So, um, that I think that makes, that makes sense why it's crossed in my brain then. Yeah, for sure. Well, they also, they toured forever. Yes. Like, I, I think the best way I can put this is, so the, the the day or the week that this album came out, they did, they were on tour with Alexis on Fire and they played like a CD release show as part of that tour. And then they played at the Opera House and hilariously, Death From Above, uh, before 1979 were added to the name, they were the first band playing. Um, and then it was Spittlefield and then Alexis on Fire and Billy Talent played. And it was insane. And I like I remember this night vividly. I remember it, there there was definitely like a sense that like something crazy was happening with both of these bands. But that that's 2003, 2005. I am at um, the Molson Amphitheater for Edgefest 2005. And normally you think of like Edgefest and the Molson Amphitheater. You're thinking like, OK, the headliners are going to be like Our Lady Peace or like the Tea Party or what have you <laughs> like the headliner, like the headliners were like Billy talent, Alexis on fire and rise against. And the sec, the second stage they had, it was just all underground operations band. It was like closet monster and a hostage life and bombs over Providence were playing. And I'm just running around this place. Like what the hell is going on? How was any of this stuff this big? But like the fact that like literally in the span of two years, it is the, the same, the same two bands I saw like co-headline the opera house or co-headlining the Molson amphitheater which is like, and doing a like, you know, radio station sponsored festival. Like that was nuts. And that was on the same album cycle. Like they, that was, that was before they had followed up this record. So I, that's the best way that I can kind of conceptualize how they grew and how they changed just in terms of popularity. And like, frankly, like in terms of how they were seen, like the, the same types, I don't know how many of the people that were at the opera house show were go were even thought like it would be cool to go to edge fest. Like I, I went, but admittedly I didn't think I was cool at the edge fest show, (laughs) but, but you know what I mean? Like it it was just (laughs) like a lot had changed with those two bands specifically. Um, 
and just all the same stuff you said about Alexis and how you're kind of listening to essentially a, a screamo band um, with this guy. Just, just his voice is almost hoarse. You can't understand a thing that he's saying. And they're being played on the radio and they're they're getting these like primetime spots at festivals. Like the same was kind of true of Billy Talent, even though they are like Ben is not as incomprehensible as, as George Pettit is. Um, and the music isn't as abrasive either. But like, I mean, his vocals are not what you would call like easy to take for most people. So I was just kind of stunned at, at what happened with both of those bands. I think it's an interesting point. And I think it's a point we're going to see a lot in this CanCon arc of, and especially in a couple of the episodes coming up and how those, to your point about like changing the sound or not changing the sound and becoming popular, this weird era in, I guess it wasn't just Canada. Like I think it was kind of everywhere, but especially in Canada where rock music really was popular and a viable, like, not only career path, but like a money-making, like mainstream career path. And we're going to see a lot of like the changes and the adaptations that artists made to fit in or not fit into that uh, in the coming weeks. And I think it's, but I think it's just, it's such a fascinating thing that will never happen again. I mean, it might, who knows? Um, But yes, to your point, um, they were largely Canada and UK driven. Um, The other thing that, that is kind of, I guess a little bit of a surprise in terms of how their success built is try Honesty's is huge for single. And then they, they released these four singles over 14 months. And the second one, the X was the one that did the worst of their four singles. I charted very briefly in the UK and was released on a seven inch with an acoustic version of try Honesty. Um, but it didn't have like a big breakthrough Uh, in Canada or the US. So the time between major singles when River Below came out was like 10 months. So maybe that helped kind of give the album a a second life and a second boost. Um, But this, The X, was not a particularly uh, successful second single. I bring that song up for two reasons. Uh, one, that Ben wrote the drums for that song, which I just thought was cool, considering he was uh, the drummer in the band initially, two names earlier. Uh, and the second is that it has the best annotation on Genius.com of any song. The annotation <laughs> for The X by Billy Talent reads, the song is about a man who is dealing with a breakup. True. <laughs> That's Very it. true. Very true. Yeah, spot the lie. You can kind of tell just in the name. Yeah. This is one of the two songs in this record that I like. Yeah, well, you you have been a man who is dealing with a breakup. So <laughs> That's true. You have been that man in the past. Who among us hasn't been a man dealing with a breakup? <laughs> I find the album sequencing interesting only from my own perspective because the two songs I like on this record are back to back. The other being Lies, which I like a lot. Yeah. Yeah, lies, mm. lies. I mean, I feel like this. The good thing about this album is like they could have gone a lot of ways with the singles. Like "Standing in the Rain," "Lies," and "Line and Sinker" all could have been 
um, even cut the curtains, I guess. They all could have been singles. Uh, but after the X, they went with River Below, which again came out like 10 months after the album had been released as a single. Um, it charted in Canada and the UK and had a very popular and controversial video directed by Sean Michael Turrell. Uh, it was inspired by Timothy McVeigh and the OKC bombings, as well as the 2002 DC sniper attacks. And, and this song and video are kind of from the perspective of someone perpetrating attacks like this. So um, some controversy there. And then Nothing to Lose was the follow-up after that. And again, some controversy uh, because that song is kind of about teenage suicide and is again a, a Shawn Michael Turrell video um, that, that plays with this idea of suicide. Now, what they did for Nothing to Lose is that video had uh, a kid's help phone message in it and they donated $1 to kid's help phone for every time uh, that that song was played on certain Canadian radio stations. Uh, that song and video also inspired a Polish movie called Suicide Room, hmm. by the way. Um, I get those two videos mixed up. I couldn't remember which song was yeah, for which video. That's fair. You know who else got those mixed up, kind of? The 2005 hmm. MMVAs. Uh, they went head-to-head -head in best video and best rock video. <laughs> uh, River Below won both. So Billy Talent beating Billy Talent in multiple categories for the 2005 MMVAs. Uh, the only <laughs> other note in terms of singles off of this, it wasn't a single, but Line and Sinker is on Grind, and I only bring that up because it's one of my favorite movies and one of Jake's favorite movies. James, Hell do you know the movie yes. Grind that we're talking about? I actually don't. Any oh, wow. time to bring up Grind is a good good time. Also one of Cassie's favorite movies. It's lovely. It's, uh, it's very good. Bam is in it, James. Hey, tell me more. Uh, Seth from the... It's Seth a skate from the it's OC a, is in it. It's a skateboarding movie about a group of friends trying to get on a skate video series, going to skate events and hijinks ensue on a road trip. It's a very, it's absolutely from like 2001. Like it could not, it it's might be the most 2003. Okay. Well, it might be the most like 2003 movie ever made. The soundtrack includes POD, simple plan, sublime, unwritten law, trapped, the Used, Less Than Jake, Blindside, oh, wow. and Billy Talent. That's an eclectic mix. Billy Talent's not officially on the soundtrack, but it's played in the movie. Get trapped the hell out of here, but but uh, you yeah, check no, that I, I want to see it. Also, you guys, yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen Betty on HBO. Uh, this is a more current no. um, skateboarding TV series that I, I, <laughs> I could not recommend more highly. I feel like the skate thing might be coming back. Oh, it absolutely is. I, I want to learn how to skate now. I never I never could when I was a kid. I would just fall off the skateboard every time. I uh, I tried to. I could move on it. And then I went to a skate park once and was like, no, this is not for me. Yeah, I could I could only basically ride the skateboard. I couldn't do much on it. So I yeah. was a weirdo Same. and I took the middle ball, the middle wheels out of my rollerblades. And so like my rollerblades only had uh, front and back wheels. They didn't have the middle two. And I took the brakes off of them and I would like grind curbs on my rollerblades instead of on a skateboard because I was more more functional on rollerblades. It's one of my favorite young Blake facts. It's extremely dumb. Uh, all right, guys, we're going to talk about I how this it. album was received and where Billy Talent went from there after this. All right, so quickly, Billy Talent, self-titled album, debuted at number six in Canada and eventually went three times platinum. It was one of the 15 top-selling albums by a Canadian band in Canada from 1996 to 2006. Uh, I don't know why that's the specific thing that uh, the Canada 150 thing laid out, but there you go. Uh, it only hit 194 in the U.S., but hey, it got on that Billboard Top 200. Uh, the release was mostly only covered by Canadian outlets, uh, although Sputnik gave it a 9 out of 10 and Rock Hard gave it 9.5 out of 10. Rock Hard would also later rank it 453 among their top 500 rock and metal albums ever. Uh, they won the 2004 Juno for Best New Group and the 2005 Juno for Group and Album of the Year. Uh, as we, we talked about their touring uh, earlier, so we'll just kind of leave it there. Uh, and they got very, very popular. So, what do you do for a second album? Well, as Gallant told the Ottawa Sun, 
We wanted to do something completely different from the first record because we had changed dramatically and had learned a lot from personal relationships. Everyone in the band is partnering up and dealing with those issues. The general theme of this record is trust, the lack thereof, or breaking up. That seemed to fuel this record. Uh, despite that, it's a little less angry, a little mellower. There are fewer of the kind of concepty songs off the first one. And uh, the, not I guess not change here, but uh, one of the developments here is that um, Ian wrote a lot of the other parts of songs beyond just his own and actually co-produced the album with Gavin Brown. Uh, Ian also did the art design and co-directed the video for Fallen Leaves, which won Best Video and Best Rock Video at the 2007 MMVAs, and I think is, like, maybe the most popular Billy Talent song, as weird as that sounds to, to say after just talking about Try Honesty. I, fall, I feel like Fallen Leaves... Really? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I've never... I can. I think I can say I've never heard this song before in my life. Okay, well, why don't we play it? I'm, a lot, I'm lying. I've heard that song before. I just know the name of it. Yeah, you pr- you probably have. It's called Standing in the Rain off of Billy Talent 1. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm they sound very similar. Uh, but no, that song has 70 million listens on Spotify. That's crazy. I was sh- positive that the other two singles, which I do know from that record, would have been bigger hits. Cause I oh, feel Red like Flag, I guess, is probably Red Flag and Devil in a whatever, De- Devil Midnight Mass. Yeah, like... I thought those songs were everywhere for a minute. Yeah, I mean they were, but the it's, it's my thinking in saying that was that like I think I feel like the Fallen Leaves video is like one of the most memorable and like successful music videos, like one of the last big music videos. Red Flag is the only one with more listens on Spotify for them than Fallen Leaves. Red Flag was the I'm looking at stills from the Fallen Leaves video on my computer right now, and I've definitely never seen the video, but I can picture the Red Flag video. Weird. I don't know. Well, there you go. A little <laughs> difference of opinions there. Uh, anyway. I'm not, not even a different opinion. I'm just surprised. No, I, I yeah, I'm surprised as well that, um, you know, I, I was a little surprised actually when I just looked it up right now and Red Flag had more listens because I would have been pretty certain that uh, Fallen Leaves did. Uh, James, <laughs> did you... Did you listen to the second album much? Did you stick with them for the second album or was this kind of a one and done for you? The second album, like I still like I, I had that album and I listened to it. I I don't know if I would have seen them when they toured that album or not. Maybe. Uh, but I was I was past the point of being like a Billy Talent devotee, I guess. I did. I, I do think like Devil in Midnight, Midnight Mass, I think, is a really good song. Um, I think they had good songs on that record. I just I thought it's funny hearing you quote them as, as saying this was going to be like a big left turn and super different. Like, I, I think what kind of turned me off was that it just kind of sounded like they were doing the same thing again to me. And I mean, you mentioned the similarities uh, between standing in the rain and fall, falling leaves, but uh, fallen leaves. But I think overall on that record, it just kind of felt like, you know, it's called Billy Talent too, but it just kind of felt like almost the same record again to me and by that point i think 
I had already sort of started kind of, you know, it's like I said before, it's like already I was like, I don't know if like I can claim ownership of like this band anymore. Like this is these I don't need to go see this band play in these like massive, you know, venues and headlining festivals and and all of this stuff. But I, I, I do think like there are some you know, staple Billy talent songs on that record. And I at least know the songs on that record. If we, if we were to go mm -hmm. to the next one and the one after that, I, I don't even know if I'm going to recognize those songs. I would agree with that. That's fair. Um, my main issue with Billy talent two and Billy talent three, both of which won Junos, by the way, uh, is that they then went away from the Billy talent naming convention. And I feel like if you do that for three albums, you got to stick to it guys. <laughs> I think you, you you at least have to stick to part of it. Like um, one of my favorite bands, Restorations, their first three are LP one, two, and three, and then the fourth one is LP five thousand. <laughs> so it's like it's still the same idea. It's just like, but I agree with you. you can, I think you can't like pick, you got to pick one. Yeah, and then I guess there's also the uh, American football approach where everything's just called American football. Yes, I suppose and that's it's true. super confusing. <laughs> so you, it's definitely it's necessary to throw that Super Bowl slash WrestleMania one, two, three, uh, IV V after these albums. Instead, uh, they pivoted away from that and released Dead Silence and Afraid of Heights in 2016. Uh, the latter of which Dasaw was nominated for Producer of the Year on at the oh. Junos. So I guess they're still still making good stuff. I, I recently watched a, a CBC Q interview with these guys uh, in preparation for this episode. And I thought it was, it stood out a lot how they credit the band still being together and having almost no turnover um, to them being a group of friends originally and still being a very tight group of friends. I say no turnover for the most part, uh, because as mentioned earlier, Aaron um, does suffer from MS. And in 2016, uh, he had to kind of step away from the band because it got too difficult for him. Jordan Hastings, who's also played in Alexis on Fire, has stepped in on drums since. Uh, Aaron is still part of the group of friends and the band Dynamic. He did that. He did four albums and over a decade of touring um, while uh, suffering from MS is, is pretty incredible. Um, I think he's credited with one of the songs on uh, Afraid of Heights. He also was brought up on stage at an Air Canada Center show in 2017 to play for a little bit, which is a, a really touching YouTube you can go check out. Beyond that, uh, Ben has done guest vocals with Anti-Flag, Cancer Bats, Rise Against, and Emigrate. And Ian got a degree in animation from Sheridan and has worked on some TV shows in in addition to turning into uh, a pretty good producer from the sounds of it and, and the Juno Awards. Although, admittedly, I did not listen to Afraid of Heights, so I can't, I cannot uh, determine if the Junos made the right call there on Producer <laughs> of the Year in 2016. Guys, we are at the part of the podcast where we would normally um, rank some songs off of the album. Oh, by the way, sorry, I just want to say, James, I agree with your transition out of Billy Talent for the most part, but in prepping for this podcast, I went back and listened to Billy Talent 2, yeah. and it's really good. It holds up pretty well, uh, more than I gave it credit for at the time. The other two things that, upon reflection of my Billy Talent fandom in 2003, um, a lot of what they called out that I didn't appreciate in at that time, politically, if you go back and listen to Billy Talent 1 and Billy Talent 2, it holds up pretty well. They were calling out the same stuff we're all calling out here in 2020, way back when. Uh, also, the album art has kind of become like, not not like a cultural staple, but like Devin Robinson of Raptors 905, who is not Canadian and not really into punk, was wearing a Billy Talent t-shirt one time. I, I think love that. It just like... Yeah, it's such a weird little wrinkle to this. Yeah, and like I'm not saying that like I was right to like kind of drift away from them. Like I person, like I wonder, like I I'm I'm not sure I was making the most sophisticated decisions about like why I care about which bands like and how long I was gonna stay with them. Like I know they got into this like weird feud with fucked up, and I might have just been like, well, I have to pick a side. And like, I, I know what <laughs> side I picked, like, I know which band I still listen to now. Um, but also, I think just even though you can have someone in Fucked Up saying, I don't want people who listen to your band to listen to my band, people who listen to your band suck, which he did literally say on diss track about Billy Talent. Um, I, 
I didn't have to listen to that. I could have just liked both. And uh, I mean, I, I kind of do like both. Like I, I listened to that first record again and I still like it. And I also like fucked up. And I, I don't know that those guys have like made up or anything over the last like, you know, 14 years since that feud started. But, you know, we can hope. I hope that's happened. Yeah. Come on the pod and hash it out, guys. <laughs> All right. We have to uh, rank some songs off the album and pick one for the mixtape. Jake. Having gone back and uh, attacked this, you you mentioned two of the the ones that stand out to you as favorites. What else you got for us? Uh, I mean, honestly, the rest of this record does not do a ton for me. I have I do think though that if this band sounded more like the song Lies more consistently, like if like you pointed out how Fall and Leave sounds a lot like Standing in the Rain, if you know Billy Talent Two had sounded like Lies, I think I might have liked them more. Cause I do like that song, but, uh, I mean, like I, I appreciate try honesty for being as successful as it was sounding like that. And like James, I think you made a good point about how Ben's vocals are not like aesthetically pleasing necessarily or sonically pleasing mm-hmm. necessarily. And I appreciate that they were able to do that and be successful. So I guess I would put try honesty third for like cultural reasons. Um, but yeah. outside of the X and lies, it just, it doesn't move the needle too much for me. Uh, James, what about you, man? I think at the time I like, if you had asked me in 2003, 2004, what my favorite Billy talent song was, I would have said prisoners of today, which was, I think the 10th the track on the record, not a single. And I would have thought that made me sound smart and cool. <laughs> um, now I'll just say I, I think it's try honesty. <laughs> like I think uh the big single, the one that got all sorts of normal people into the band is I, I think like it was the single for a reason. And I think all of the best parts of Billy Talent are on display in that song. I think he yeah, he has this um kind of screechy, high pitched voice, but I think it's used really effectively in that song and like the chorus is just killer. And I, I think I on like I I think it holds up. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I were to, I'll, I'll still say Prisoner's Day as like my second choice. Um, and then maybe after that, uh, yeah, I like, I like River Below. I, I think Voices of Violence, the, the, the closing song is, is a cool song. It's like a faster one. Like, I don't know if like Jake, maybe that might be the one that's closer to, to lies. Of I do else. like that song. Yeah. I actually did. Let's yeah. Going back to it. I actually did like that song. You're yeah. Right. That's, that's more of like a punky song. Um, so I dig that one too, but like yeah. I don't know, the whole record's solid, but yeah, I, I would, if I was going to pick three, I guess, try honesty prisoners of today and then river below. All right. Well then I think that, uh, we're all close to an agreement. Cause I would, I would nominate try honesty as the, the best song and the inclusion on the mixtape as well. So, uh, Jake, as long as you have no objections, try honesty is going on the mixtape. No objections here. Follow James at outside the NBA on Twitter for some very good music takes and some very good NBA writing. Also a thank you to our producer, Dylan. Dylan's the best and pulls all of this together. Even when I make last minute changes to the run <laughs> sheet, because I find the Billy talent ska song on YouTube and want Jake to hear it. Look, um, I appreciate so thank it. Thank you to Dylan James. Thanks so much for doing this, man. Thank you for having me. I'll come on whenever you want. Yeah, I mean, hey, nobody, very few people know the uh, early to mid 2000s punk scene quite like you and Sam Sutherland. I feel like if we ever got you guys on the same episode, you know, Jake and I have joked plenty about people wanting to replace us as the hosts on these shows. But if this were a CanCon specific show, it would definitely be you and Sam Sutherland in the host's chair. So if you ever uh, want to do like Kazaya by Protest the Hero, then like you shoot me a tech. I mean, Protest the Hero is in the brainstorming doc, so. It's not a, it's not, I'll try to give you more than like half a day's notice next time too. (laughs) Oh, I don't, I need like no notice whatsoever to talk about that. Perfect.
Please try the fish. <laughs>